All right, welcome everyone to our OpenSim webinar. My name is Jen Hicks. Uh, I'm the OpenSim R&D manager and also the associate director of our National Center in Simulation and Rehab Research, which, which supports OpenSim. And I'll be serving as the moderator today. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter, Carmichael Ong. Uh, he'll be presenting on predictive simulations to study the plantar flexors in gait pathology. Uh, so OpenSim is a freely available software package for visu visualizing musculoskeletal systems and simulating movements of humans and animals. Uh, and the first goal of our webinar series is to showcase all of the wonderful research that's being performed around the world with OpenSim. Uh, OpenSim is also a large and growing community of users, and so the second goal of our webinar series is to provide a platform so that members of the OpenSim community uh, can communicate and collaborate. Uh, before we get started, a few quick reminders about the format of today's webinar. Uh, so we definitely want to take time to answer your questions, but we'll do that at the end of the presentation using the Q&A panel and WebEx. Uh, if you need any additional technical help, uh, please consult the guide on our website. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Uh, so Carmichael Ong is currently a PhD candidate at, here at Stanford in the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab, uh, and he's interested in using predictive simulation to better understand and improve human movement. He earned his bachelor's in biomedical engineering from Brown University and an MS in bioengineering from Stanford. Uh, he's also the recipient of the Stanford BioX Graduate Student Fellowship and was a Cybell Scholar as well. Uh, so we're really excited to hear about your predictive simulations today, Carmichael. And with that, I will let you take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Jen. So simulations have great potential to expand our understanding of human movement. They allow us to ask questions that are either difficult or impossible to measure experimentally. Today, I'll talk about some work that we've been doing to, sim to use simulation to establish cause-effect relationships between plantar flexor deficits, common in gait pathologies, and observed gait adaptations. The work I'll show today was done along with my co-authors, Thomas Guidenbeek, Jen Hicks, and Scott Dell. So why study the plantar flexors? They comprise an important group of muscles that run down the back of the lower leg and push the foot down for propulsion and gait. The two major muscles are the two heads of the gastrocnemii and the soleus. They both cross behind the ankle, and the gastrocnemius additionally crosses uh, the back of the knee. A study by Liu and colleagues quantified their contribution to propulsion during walking by looking at the acceleration of the center of mass caused by these muscles. On the right are accelerations of the gastrocnemius and soleus plotted against gait cycle and the lines represent the vector direction and magnitude of the accelerations at a given point in time. Heel strike occurs at 0% gait cycle here, and swing occurs around 60%. So we see that these lines in late stance on the right are, are showing that they're accelerating the body forward in late stance. Deficits in these muscles are prevalent in many gait pathologies, such as cerebral palsy, stroke, muscular dystrophy, and Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Although some of these are caused by pathologies in the neural system, such as CP, stroke, and Charcot-Marie tooth disease, problems on the muscle level are common, such as plantar flexor weakness and contracture. These have been measured through different imaging and functional tests. For instance, in individuals with cerebral palsy, MRI has shown their muscles to be smaller and shorter. In stroke, dynamometry showed decreased ankle plantar flexion torque on the affected side, and ultrasound has shown that the gastrocnemius can be shorter on the affected side as well. Dynamometry was also used to show weaker voluntary plantar flexion uh, with muscular dystrophy, and in Charcot-Marie tooth disease, uh, it's been clinically observed uh, that there's plantar flexor atrophy and equinus too. Studying the effect of these plantar flexor deficits is difficult because it's hard to isolate their effect in any given individual. This is because of other often co-occurring deficits, 
such as those associated with the skeletal and neural systems. One experiment showed the effect of plantar flexor weakness by performing a tibial nerve block in one leg of healthy individuals. However, this is invasive and would be difficult to repeat for many other muscles or other conditions such as contracture. Simulation studies have uh, also been used to suggest strong links between muscle deficits and gait adaptations. For example, Cat Steele did a, a study of individuals walking with a crouch gait and estimated the minimum muscle strength needed to generate these motions. However, since experimental data was used, they are confounded with the other de deficits an individual may have, which limits the ability of such studies to establish a cause-effect relationship. Unlike tracking simulations, predictive simulations are simulations in which the kinematics are generated without experimental data. Work by Geyer and Herr showed that this could be done, and we can see still frames of the simulation on top and the generated ground reaction force along the bottom. We can see how the ground reaction force is noisier and not as regular as when tracking data. However, it is still stable enough to generate multiple gate cycles over several seconds. Designing a controller for this can be difficult, but Geyer and Herr achieve this by using muscle reflexes to simplify the problem. A high-level controller used a contact model to determine if the foot was either in stance or swing. Then the modeler chooses which reflex laws are active in each state. Examples of low-level reflex laws used in this and other studies include muscle length feedback, force feedback, velocity feedback, and feedback to the muscles that stabilize the torso. Later work led by Sung Woon Song and Tim Dorn showed how controllers of this type could adapt and be used to generate a variety of gates. This included gates such as walking, running, turning, stair ascent, inclined walking, and walking with a backpack. Furthermore, Dorn and colleagues used these simulations to see if commonly observed adaptations during inclined walking or walking with a backpack were adopted by the model. This highlights the strength of predictive simulations. Predictive simulations are powerful tools that can be used to establish cause-effect relationships in gait, since we can introduce systematic changes into them, like adding a backpack or modeling muscle weakness, and then observe the kinematic adaptations that the model adopts. In our study, we sought to use predictive simulations to study how plantar flexor weakness and contracture affects gait. We have three main goals to achieve to do this. First, because pathologic gait is often slower, we wanted to validate that our framework can generate simulations of walking that realistically adapt to changes in speed. Second, we wanted to validate that the framework could choose a realistic self-selected walking pattern and speed. Finally, we introduced models of plantar flexor weakness or contracture and then generated new gait patterns. I'll first go over the methods we used to generate these predictive simulations. I'll start with discussing the optimization framework for training the gate controller. There's an inner loop that generates simulations, which I'll talk about in a little bit. In the outer loop, the simulations generated from the inner loop are evaluated by an objective function. These objective function values are fed into an optimizer. And in this study, we use the covariance matrix adaptation evolutionary strategy which is a popular algorithm in this field. This optimizer um, algorithm updates the new controller parameters, uh, which are the design variables in our problem. And these parameters are fed back into the controller to generate a new simulation. In the inner loop, we have a controller that is generating excitations based on sensory feedback, such as muscle force, length, and velocity. Thus, this serves as our reflex-based controller. These excitations are fed into our musculoskeletal model, and OpenSim is used to integrate the equation of motion forward in time. For those familiar with trajectory optimization problems, this is known as a single shooting problem. I'll next go into the detail of our muscular skeletal model, gate controller, and objective function. Since generating these simulations is computationally expensive, we simplified a previous model to decrease computation time. Starting from a model originally developed by Delphin colleagues in OpenSim, 
We reduced the model to nine degrees of freedom, which includes a planar joint for the pelvis and flexion extension at the hip, knee, and ankle of each leg. We reduced the number of muscles by combining muscles with similar functions. We chose to use the nine muscle groups shown here. These muscles represent the major uniarticular and biarticular muscle groups that drive sagittal plane motion. For contact, we used a compliant contact model from Hunt and Crossley with one large sphere at the heel and two smaller spheres at the toes, shown as the blue um, spheres in the model down here. Now I'll go into detail about the controller that we used. Uh, based on previous reflex-based controllers, our walking controller uses states that are based on key phases of the gait cycle. We used five states in total, which approximate the timings of early stance, mid-stance, pre-swing, swing, and landing preparation. Transitions between these states are based on ground reaction forces and kinematics. There are four major control laws that we use to calculate each muscle's excitation. First is a simple control term, constant control term. Second is stretch control, which can be based on muscle length or velocity. The plus here denotes a positive feedback. Third is a force feedback term. And finally, there's a PD control or position uh, uh, velocity control for the muscles to stabilize the position velocity of the pelvis tilt angle. This diagram shows when certain low-level control laws are active in the gait cycle. I won't go into detail here about every piece, but I'll highlight that as modelers, it's our job to design these controllers and to decide when these low-level controls turn off and on. For example, we have positive muscle force feedback in the gastrocnemius and soleus during mid-stance and pre-swing, which provides push-off at the end of stance. Altogether, we had 90 design variables for our optimization problem. Our objective function J is composed of four parts whose contributions can be controlled by adjusting the relative weights. The first part is cost of transport. This term seeks to minimize energy per distance, and we used a metabolics model originally developed by Umberger and colleagues, which Yoshida and colleagues then modified and validated with tracking simulations of running. The speed penalty served two purposes. First, it ensured that each step-to-step -step speed is close to the target speed. And second, it applies a large penalty for falling. Ligaments were modeled as variable stiffness rotational springs that engage during hyperextension or, or hyperflexion of a joint. This injury term penalized the torques that they generate. Finally, we promoted head stability by penalizing excessive accelerations uh, at the head. The relative weights for each term, shown by each term now, were manually tuned to promote the optimizer to quickly find solutions that did not fall over, and then to find solutions that avoided injury and stabilized the head. Now I'll go over how we validated that our framework could generate realistic simulations. Looking back, back at our aims, we wanted to first validate that our framework could generate simula simulations of walking uh, that realistically adapt to changes in speed. To validate our results over a wide range of speeds, we began by generating seven simulations between speeds of 0.5 and 2.0 meters per second at intervals of 0.25 meters per second. So as shown on the right here, we then compared to our results, uh, our results to experimental results, including cost of transport and kinematic measures. So how do our results look? I'll show videos of three of the seven speeds here, our slowest, fastest, and middle speed. Um, I'm gonna first switch over to a video sharing mode uh, during testing, we found that this gave us better performance, but depending on your connection, it may still not be smooth. Um, however, I do want to say that videos of all the simulations from this work 
are available in the supplementary material, and I'll give a link to the preprint which comes along with all the supplementary material at the end of this talk. So what you'll see in each video is you'll see the muscles light up from blue to red as they're activated. And you'll see these yellow arrows um, that represent the ground reaction forces. I'll start by playing the slowest and go to the fastest. So we're going to see the videos go from left to right. So what you see as, as these videos are running that the optimization framework uh, was indeed able to generate a steady gate um, at a wide range of speeds. Switch back over here. Sorry, give me a second here. Here we go. So we can further validate our simulations by analyzing key metabolic and kinematic quantities. And we found that our simulated cost of transport was similar to experimental data. Um, this plot shows simulation results with black dots and experimental data with gray lines. We see that the values of our cost of transport fall about in line with experimental results. And we also see the characteristic um, cost of transport poll, which gave us confidence that our framework could later choose a realistic self-selected gate speed automatically. We also compared common spatiotemporal parameters between our simulations and experimental data. Again, simulations are denoted with black dots and experimental data are denoted with lines. On the left, we see that the percent stance phase, which describes the percentage of a gate cycle that each leg is in stance, follows experimental data well. For step length and cadence, we saw that our simulations tended to take a longer step and had a slower cadence than seen experimentally. However, the increasing trends with speed both agree with experimental trends. For a second aim, we wanted to validate that the framework can choose a realistic self-selected walking pattern and speed. So to do this, we uh, had to adjust our objective function slightly. In the speed term, instead of prescribing a target speed, we only ensure a minimum step speed of 0.75 meters per second by penalizing any step that's slower than that. And I'll show this video uh, that shows the resulting simulation after making this change. So we can see in this video that the uh, resulting simulation after making the change found a steady gate at about 1.21 meters per second. So we validate our simulation by comparing to experimental kinematic and kinetic data. And we'll first start by looking at the sagittal plane joint angles. Our simulation is shown with the black line and experimental data is shown with the gray band. The start of the gait cycle at 0% is at heel strike. I'm showing from top to bottom the hip, knee, and ankle joint angles. Overall, the simulation does a good job of generating a realistic motion, but I'll highlight a few discrepancies. First, we see excessive hip and knee flexion during the swing phase. 
And we think that this occurs because extra hip and knee flexion is needed for foot clearance. Uh, and this is because we use a planar model that lacks degrees of freedom, such as pelvic tilt and hip abduction, which would help with foot clearance. We also note that the knee angle was more constant throughout stance than in experiments. And I'll discuss this more after we take a look at our joint moments. In the middle now are the hip, knee, and ankle joint moments. <clears throat> Overall, the joint moments follow experimental data well, except for the knee during stance. And I'll go into more detail about these discrepancies now. So on the right, I've added the still frame of the ground reaction force vector, so the yellow vector here. And this is, we can see the ground reaction force relative to the knee joint during stance. And we see that the ground reaction force is in front of the knee, causing an extension moment. If you recall, our model takes longer steps than experimental subjects do, which, which may cause this. Because the ground reaction force is generating an extension moment, the muscles about the knee must then generate a flexion moment to protect the knee, uh, explaining this discrepancy in the circle in the middle. Finally, uh, if we look at ground reaction forces, we find that our simulated ground reaction forces match data, experimental data well. And thus, overall, we believe our simulations capture many of the salient features of walking, although our model may take uh, longer steps than is expected. So now I'll switch to uh, how we simulated the plantar, plantar flexor deficits. Again, our last aim was to introduce models of plantar flexor weakness and contracture, generate new gait path patterns, and then analyze the resulting gaits. We modeled either weakness or contracture in one or both of the plantar flexors. Our model had two musculotendon actuators that model the plantar flexors. So that's the gastrocnemius and soleus. Um, and in each of the gastrocnemius and or soleus, or in both, we introduced mild, moderate, or severe weakness by decreasing peak isometric forces of these muscles to 25%, 12.5%, and 6.25% of the unimpaired value from the model. We then modeled contracture by decreasing optimal fiber length to 85%, 70%, and 55% of the unimpaired value. In total, this led to 18 cases that were tested, but for this talk, I'll focus on the cases with the most pronounced changes. So first I'll focus on results from our simulations of plantar flexor weakness. And I'll show a video of this right now. So this, this video shows how the model skate adapted with increasing severity of weakness in both plantar flexors. You'll see with increasing weakness, the model will choose a slower heel walking gait. And you'll also see the bright red color in the in the plantar flexors as they must increase their activations to compensate for the weakness. So we'll analyze the moderate and severe plantar flexor weakness cases by looking at key kinematic and kinetic quantities. First, we'll start at the ankle. And the natural question that could be asked is if the plantar flexor weakness decreases ankle plantar flexion capacity. Here are the ankle plantar flexion moment plots for moderate weakness on the left and severe weakness on the right. Experimental data of unimpaired individuals are shown with the gray band and the simulations are the lines. Simulation of an unimpaired model is represented by the black line and the model with plantar flexor weakness by the blue line. So the gray band and black lines represent the same data as they did in the validation section before. We see during late stance that
that cases of weakness showed a reduced ankle plantar flexion capacity when trying to push off. This serves as validation uh, that our model of weakness did affect uh, plantar flexion moment capacity as one would expect. It's thought that plantar flexor weakness due to, for instance, overlengthening the Achilles tendon during the surgery leads to a calcaneal or heel walking gait. We can look at the ankle kinematics plotted now on top to investigate this. We do see, especially in severe weakness, that the ankle is more dorsiflex throughout the whole gait cycle, um, and especially uh, looking at the stance phase, which shows that the model walked with a calcaneal gait. It is also thought that plantar flexor weakness may contribute to crouch gait. Crouch gait is characterized by excessive knee flexion during stance and often occurs with excessive hip flexion. To see if plantar flexion weakness caused a crouch, we analyze the hip and knee uh, flexion angles. Here are the knee flexion angles for moderate and severe weakness. We see that the blue and black lines are very similar, especially uh, when we look at the range of motion of these curves. Thus, it does not appear that the model was in a crouch. Our hip trajectories tell a similar story, that weakness did not cause the model to adopt a crouch, as the blue and black lines are similar over the gait cycle. There are some times in late stance, however, that there is a slight decrease in hip flexion. However, since these cases are walking more slowly, the reduced extension in late stance is more likely due to the slower walking speed. So now I'll switch and talk about our results from introducing plantar flexor contracture into the model. And I'll show a video of that right now. And in this video, we'll see how the model adapted uh, its gait by uh, it's it adapted with increasing severity of contracture in both plantar flexors and we'll see that with increasing contracture that the model chose a crouched toe walking gait So note that it will be walking more on its toes, and especially in this severe case with some increased uh, knee and hip flexion too. So since contracture leads to tightness in the plantar flexors, it is thought that contracture in these muscles uh, may generate excessive plantar flexor moments in gait. We'll investigate this in three cases of severe contracture. So severe contracture in the soleus only will be on the left, severe contracture in the gastrocnemius only in the middle, and severe contracture in both plantar flexors will be shown on the right. Here are the plots for ankle plantar flexion moment. Recall that the gray band is experimental data of unimpaired individuals, and the black line is the simulation of an unimpaired model. The orange line here here now represents a simulation of a model with plantar flexure contracture. We can see that excessive plantar flexion moments are seen during early stance. And again, this serves as validation that our model of contracture is working as intended. Plantar flexure contracture is also thought to contribute to Aquinas or toe walking gait. And we can analyze the ankle kinematics to assess this. And we do, in fact, see some increased plantar flexion throughout stance in all three cases. Thus, we see that contracture in one or both of the muscles alone cause the model to adopt an Aquinas gait. We can also see a more pronounced adaptation in the left and right plots, which indicate that cases of contracture of the soleus only, or in both plantar flexors, um, were more had more pronounced changes than when compared to gastrocnemius contracture alone. We also analyzed if contracture would cause the model to adopt a crouch gait. 
Uh, again, we'll look at knee and hip kinematics to investigate this. Here are the knee kinematics over the gait cycle for, again, the soleus only on the left, gastrocnemius only in the middle, and contracture in both plantar flexors on the right. And we see during stance how there was a larger increase in knee flexion angle for the contracture of the soleus only and contracture of both plantar flexors. However, this is not as pronounced for gastrocnemius only. Our hip kinematics tell a similar story as the knee, as we see a more pronounced increase in hip angle throughout stance for the soleus only and both plantar flexor contracture cases as compared with the gastrocnemius only case. This is particularly interesting since the gastrocnemius crosses the back of the knee and can directly generate a knee flexion moment. However, the soleus, with soleus contracture alone, we see a more crouched gait. Thus, the crouch posture adopted may be due to the model walking on its toes rather than the gastrocnemius directly generating a knee flexion moment. I'll finish up with some conclusions from our work and highlight resources available if you'd like to learn more about our work. So we first created and validated a framework to study um, the effect of plantar flexor deficits on gait, and we first validated it by generating many simulations of unimpaired gait at many different speeds. And then we introduced weakness and in, models of weakness and contracture and analyzed their resulting gates. Some key insights from our study are that severe plantar, plantar flexor weakness caused the model to adopt a heel walking gait. And this agrees with hypotheses of weakness caused in cases such as over lengthening the Achilles. Second, severe plantar flexor contracture caused the model to adopt a toe walking gait, which again agrees with common hypotheses. Third, plantar flexor weakness did not induce a crouch, but plantar flexor contracture did. Um, although this may not agree with some hypotheses that plantar flexor weakness can cause crouch gait, since our analysis uh, only used isolated weakness, it does not rule out that weakness in these muscles may play a role in crouch gait when other deficits are present as well. <clears throat> Finally, soleus contracture <clears throat> caused a, excuse me, <clears throat> soleus contracture <clears throat> caused a more crouch gait than gastrocnemius contracture suggesting that crouch gait is not directly caused by excessive gastrocnemius force. And this is an interesting finding since the gastrocnemius crosses the back of the knee and could directly cause knee flexion, while the soleus does not cross the knee. A more thorough discussion of our results can be found in our preprint, and the preprint is up on BioArchive, and you can find it through the link that we're showing here. We've also provided our results, setup files, and Docker build instructions at our SimTK project page uh, shown here. And we hope that this will help others to validate and build off of our work. Finally, the optimizations from our work were done using a simulation and optimization, optimization framework called SCOPE. Uh, Thomas Geidenbeek, a co-author of the work here, uh, has created the software package to help others generate their own predictive simulations easily. Uh, see scone.software to download the software and for documentations of the software. Finally, thank you to all for listening uh, and special thanks to uh, the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab who have all pitched in so many good ideas in this uh, through this process and specific thanks to Chris, Saporva, AJ, Tan, and Jenny for their dis wonderful discussions and feedback on this work. Great, thank you, Carmichael, uh, for a great talk. Really interesting work. Uh, now we'll go ahead and get started with the Q&A session. Uh, so you want to find the Q&A box um, by clicking on the little the little ellipses and select Q and A, and then type in your question and make sure you select to ask all panelists. 
Um, so go ahead and type those questions in. I think we already have a couple questions that have come up. So let me go ahead and find those. Here we go. Uh, so a question from Mohamed Shorje. Um, since the model is 2D, uh, why are there two contact spheres at the toes is the first question. Right, yeah. Um, so I tried one larger contact sphere and I just, it's kind of just a modeling and testing and validation cycle that I did on that. And um, the two spheres with, um, so another limitation was that at the time we could only have, uh, we could only share um, some of the contact parameters between all of the contact spheres. So there's more of a technical thing. And I found that with two smaller spheres, I got uh, a more realistic response uh, at, at toe off or push off. Um, with the two smaller spheres. So it's a combination of some technical limitations that was done a few years ago uh, and just some validation work that showed we were getting better results with the two sphere, two smaller spheres. Okay, thanks Carmichael for clarifying. Uh, now an anonymous question. Uh, great talk. Uh, what computation times were required to generate the results? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so each optimization run that we would do would take somewhere between 10 and 15 hours. Um, and to ensure that we were in a pretty good spot, we would take the, um, we would chain optimization runs together. We would take the best results from the, the previous runs uh, and run them again. Uh, but we found that actually uh, we, we settled into a good, good answer within two optimization steps. Um, there's uh, more detail in the preprint too about exactly how we did that. We also did some parallelized optimizations to to search the space uh, uh, more quickly as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, now another question from uh, Mohamed Chirurgie. Um What is the justification for minimizing metabolic costs when simulating pathological gains? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, and I think that there's a lot, uh, many more questions to be answered, especially with pathologic gait, whether or not that's um, whether or not that's even the objective function that they want to minimize. Um, for this study, we wanted to keep kind of everything else um, constant. So we really wanted to isolate just what happens with plantar flexor weakness or just what happens with plantar flexor contracture and keep the objective function the same um, because in simulation that's what we can do we can remove these constraints that uh, that might uh, be changing in the neural sense so we really really wanted to keep the neural and the skeletal and things like that all constant and really focus on what happens if there's only very specific isolated changes and um, I think that strengthens the case that, yeah, it, that even with these specific isolated changes, if we saw these adaptations, we, we really know that that could be a strong uh, cause effect relationship. Okay, and then there's a, a question related that you've kind of already answered, but just in the interest of being really clear, um, its third question was did the objective function terms and weights stay the same throughout the cases? Yes, yes. To be really clear, the uh, for those same reasons, we kept the weights the same. OK, so now a question from Corey Hoffman. Uh, great work. Uh, the opposite directionality of the knee joint torque, um, flexor versus extensor during stance in the validation portion seems like a, a major limitation of this work. Could you comment on that a little bit more? Yeah, it's it's something that we worried about a little bit, but um, I think as we adjusted the model and saw that indeed the um, the knee would actually flex in cases of contracture, and it was it it might be hard to tell, but it actually started taking shorter steps as well. Um, that uh, we did see the effect of these uh, changes even if our original starting point 
maybe wasn't, if the absolute values weren't quite right, um, we did see the trends that we would want to see. And I think that at least gets around that problem too. But it, there's definitely more work to be done to improve this type of controller with a 2D environment to make sure that we get that knee joint right, uh, especially when we ask um, questions that uh, might involve the knee more, like knee joint contact forces or things like that. Okay, thanks, Carmichael. Um, now a question from Adam Clancy. Um, actually, maybe before I um, read his question, could you clarify a little bit about what the preprint is? And because not everyone in the biomechanics field might be aware of the preprint process and why we're doing that and the status of the paper as far as its review. Sure, yeah, I can definitely talk about that. So um, if you're not familiar, uh, there's a growing trend in science that um, before your paper is uh, accepted by a journal that you can provide your uh, paper up on these preprint servers. So you might see archive or bio, bio archive and things like that. And they allow uh, uh, scientists to get their work out more quickly and share it with uh, the community uh, before the whole cycle of review is done. Um, so there is a caveat in that the, we, we provide the preprint, but it is specifically not peer reviewed yet. Um, but the work has been submitted uh, for peer review. Um, so uh, the work is likely to change as we as we get uh, reviews in. Um, but we do provide it as is right now so that you guys can work on it and look at it now instead of waiting many months from now. Great, and we'll update when the yes through the review process. Yeah, and we'll everything. we'll update through there, and I believe places like BioArchive and Archive, when it does finally get accepted too, uh, we'll update their links to point towards uh, the final version as well. Okay, thanks, Carmichael. Um, so this is a question from Adam Clancy. Uh, with the model muscle weakness at the ankle, did you see a redistribution of joint torque toward more proximal joints, such as the hip? Um, like, for example, if you see in the gait of older adults. Yeah, um, I can't remember. I, I, I do think we saw a little bit of that. I think it was a little less than I expected. Um, but yes, I think if I recall correctly, we did see some increased, just a little bit increase of joint torques at the hip, a flexion during um, kind of late stance, early swing. Um, and all, all of those data can be found also in the supplemental section of the preprint as well, if you want to take a closer look. Okay, thanks. Um, so then uh, now we have a question from Christoph Leitner. Uh, Carmichael, could you explain a bit more about the validation process? I wasn't sure if I understood correctly, but did you validate the simulation data via 3D kinematic and ultrasound data for muscles and tendons? I see. We didn't validate against muscles specific. Um, so uh, I guess I should be clear uh, if this is validating um, the that our framework could generate a bunch of simulations at different speeds. We only validated against kinematic and kinetics. So kind of your typical kinematic kinetic trajectories from a gate lab. Um, so we didn't check muscle lengths or velocities or anything like that for that level. Um, but our models of plantar flexor weakness and contracture were inspired by things that we did see in the literature. So our model of weakness was inspired roughly, that we had roughly the same muscle strength as seen in Kat Steele's paper where she looked at the minimum muscle strengths needed for crouch gait. And our models of contracture, our severe contracture, were based on some animal experience, uh, experiments of contracture in either a mouse or rat model. I can't remember specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so now a question from Tommy Chita regarding next steps. How reasonable or difficult do you think it would be to extend these results to a spatial non-planar model? Uh, and would you expect to learn anything new about um, 
contracture and weakness, I presume. That's a that's a great question, Tom. Um, I I think it's totally doable. Sun Moon's song did do some work in its 2015 paper to show um, that he can also add some hip adduction, abduction, um, and release that degree of freedom. Uh, so it would need more testing and tweaking with this model exactly to get those muscle parameters right and to do validation again. Um, how hard is it? Uh, that's <laughs> you may have to ask Sungmin about that. Uh, it, I'm sure it would take a bit of time. But uh, to the second point of your question, I think there would be a lot of valuable things gained from that, especially since one of our limitations was uh, we don't have hip adduction abduction, which is a very common um, adaptation you'll see. So some hip circumduction uh, is seen a lot. We, we couldn't capture that. Um, so if our model captured it, it would be an increased hip and knee flexion and swing to clear the foot. Uh, but yes, that, that degree of freedom is, is really important to, to study. Okay, now another question, uh, and this may be the last question unless there are other ones that come in. Uh, this is from Inky Kim. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Could you explain a bit more about the future direction for identifying the boundary conditions beyond which this predictive simulation does not conform? Interesting. So the the boundary, yeah, um, I'd say I'd say these predictive simulations, the boundaries that we know of, do pretty well if we're studying something like, again, walking um, between the ranges I showed here. Um, something I didn't mention in the talk, though, uh, that is in the paper, is we saw some slow kind of more resonant ground reaction forces at the really slow speed, so like 0.5 meters per second or 0.75 meters per second. So um, uh, I'll direct you to the preprint for that, but in, in brief, uh, it would mean that our ground reaction forces maybe at the really, really slow speeds um, may not be, uh, you can't read into them too much. Um, and that was more of a consequence of some of the speed of simulation trade-offs and the realistic ground reaction forces that we saw uh, just with the parameters that we chose through the validation process. Um, yeah, so if, if I'd say that these simulations are pretty good for if, you're, if the motions and the adaptations you want to look at are primarily sagittal plane um, adaptations, this is, a, this is a pretty good model for that. Um, but yeah, if, if you're going to do some um, some really big changes to this model, um, further validation uh, will probably be needed first, especially if you do something like extend it to 3D. OK, great. That makes sense. Um, so we do have one last question. Uh, this is from Babak Beki. Uh, great work. Could you explain about the effects of shoe wear on the model, as in reality patients don't uh, typically walk with bare feet? And thanks again for the great presentation. Uh, good question. I, I, I can't say uh, that, the, that the parameters were necessarily chosen. Uh, so I'll say this, the, the, the model looks like it doesn't have shoes because of the way that it's, it's shown, but the parameters uh, of, the, of the contact spheres, in a sense, capture the whole foot, heel pad, shoe or not shoe, something like that. Um, uh, complex altogether. Uh, I, I don't know for sure how these numbers would change, whether or not you want to have, if you want to study changes in shoe compliance or a different shoe that someone's working on. I can't say too much to that, but, um, but if you did want to look at that, that would be something that would be interesting, changing those parameters uh, to investigate changes in that, in that ground contact. Okay, there was another question that came in about the contact model. So we'll keep going. We're still, sure. we still haven't hit the, the hour mark. Um, and thanks everyone for the really great questions. Uh, this is a question from Drew Gupta. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Can you talk more about how well the contact model worked? Uh, was there any instance of the foot crossing the plane of the ground? Uh, if yes, how would that affect the results? Yes, so um, if you go 
uh, and look at the videos, you will see the, the foot will go into the ground a little bit. Um, the contact parameters that I settled on are um, perhaps a little um, a little more compliant than you might expect. Um, but the, the process I went through was to to adjust those uh, those terms and then look at the ground reaction forces that we're seeing and that that our ground reaction forces were matching well with, um, with what you would expect from experiments. Um, but the, so I'll say this one plus to a more compliant um, sphere is that you'll get faster simulation times, which is very important in optimizations like this. So um, while foot contact, the, the exact um, how the foot went through the floor and whatnot was a little less uh, interesting to us, we at the end really wanted to make sure our ground reaction forces were correct. Um, another thing I'll say is if you look at them closely, look at the, the videos closely, um, one thing you'll notice is the toes really do go into the ground a bit. And I'll say that I think that's not so bad here because the um, because this model lacks a, a, a meta, an MTP joint. Um, and so while in normally you would you would normally see the toes you know, um, kind of pull up a little bit, uh, the toes actually go a little bit into the ground. But so you can imagine kind of the MTP joint staying on top of the level ground. And so I found that that was probably a reasonable trade off since our model just doesn't have that degree of control for that degree of freedom. So we had we picked the parameters such that the MTP joint, you know, we, we kind of created a false toe joint by by making the toes a little more squishy, which probably reflects more of what's going on in the toes than if we had made a really stiff contact sphere at the toes. OK, yeah. All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and end the Q&A session there. Um, just a couple points to wrap up. Um, so thank you again, Carmichael, for the really great talk. And, and thank you to everyone in the audience for the really great questions and discussion. Um, in closing, we want to uh, acknowledge that OpenSIM and this webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH, including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Um, you can find more information about the center, upcoming events, and other resources for the OpenSIM community at our website. Uh, we also ask that you complete the survey that will appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion of the webinar. This will help us improve our webinar series and identify uh, new topics for upcoming webinars. Uh, and again, thank you all for participating. We hope you'll continue to stay involved with OpenSim, and we hope to see you uh, at the next webinar. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Carmichael.